Hi guys, welcome to Real Food Recovery. We are on episode 17. Good hello to Jamie. Glad you are here with us. Hi, glad to be here. I can't believe 17. Lucky I know. 17. <laughs> we are rocking and rolling, man. Yeah. And today we are going to be talking about why addictive substances are part of our tree of life. We have a tree of life with several branches. Some branches are smaller, some branches are larger, and those may change in your life as time goes on. But we wanted to um, include part of recovery, uh, one of the foundational elements of addictive substances and why that matters to us. One of the things that we know is we all have reward pathways in our brain. And when we start in with addictive substances, what happens in the brain is through repeated exposure, they become down-regulated. Or in other words, it takes more to get the same high. For me, you know, a row of uh, Girl Scout cookies could totally have been a, a single serving where someone who just had never eaten oh. sugar would have been satiated. So that's what happens to us. The problem with that is when you have an addiction, it organizes your day around regulating the pleasure pain response. Yes. And so through that, you're not able to be your true authentic selves when you're deep in the addiction. You're unable to serve both places, your authentic self, as well as the addiction. And unfortunately, the addiction usually wins. And so it robs us from enjoying the everyday pleasures of life, which means our life gets smaller, much totally. smaller. It locks us into this small life versus when we don't, when we're not bound by the bonds of addiction, we have this big, full, beautiful, rich life with people in it and hobbies and interests and yeah. things that are just a lot of fun. And we were able to derive natural pleasures from those activities. So that's why we added it. So what are the things that we talk about? What are the addictive substances that we we consider yeah. on our list. Actually, Jamie, do you want to share what the sure. list is? Yeah, Paige, this is a really important topic. And, you know, we actually, the, the phrase, is, the phrase, these two words, addictive substances are very, we're very careful with those words because they are substances. They're not foods. They're not, they're not treats. They're not uh, must haves. They're substances. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when you think about those, the word substance addiction, the list is quite long, actually. So, you know, there's the classics like nicotine. Those are, that's an addictive substance, alcohol, addictive, recreational drugs, marijuana, you know, things like that are, are considered addictive. Caffeine actually is an addictive substance mm -hmm. in, in that same class. Um, prescription drugs, as we know, certainly the opioid crisis, for example, is an, ex is an example of an addictive prescription drug. Um, then we're, we also added some things that you might not automatically think of for addiction, which is sugar, white flour, or fl really flour of any kind. And the reason that we say both of those things is sugar in its form is highly processed and powdered as is flour in, in its form, highly processed and, and powdered, just like cocaine, heroin, and a lot of the the drugs that are out there, illegal or recreational, that are out there, um, they are they are powdered as well, and they are highly addictive because of the way they hit their bloodstream. Okay, so we're adding to this list now sweeteners and artificial and plant based sweeteners as well. So mm -hmm. all of you, all of you monk fruit or stevia lovers, mm -hmm. I don't care if it's stevia leaf, it's an addictive substance. That was me. And we'll, and me too, well, me too. And we'll talk about why that is, right? We'll talk about the, what, what qualifies as an addictive, an addictive substance in a moment, um, scientifically, but we're going to add to this list, high fructose corn syrup, mm -hmm. an addictive substance, mm -hmm. substance. It's not a food guys, not a food, no. uh, preservatives, preservatives found in food, monosodium wow. glutamate, glutamate, also an addictive substance, food dyes, colorings. These are addictive substances because- right our bodies don't know how to break them down or what to do with them naturally. So they have a response to the body to actually protect it. And they, and in order for us, we feel worse. So we eat more of this stuff to feel better, right. which is actually worse for us. Yeah. And because our tolerance level goes up, that's what, that's what increases the addiction. We need more to feel okay 
mm-hmm. which is actually worse for us. Yeah. And that's why they're an addictive substance. Yeah. It's the pleasure pain balance that's just on fire. You know, so we talk a lot about why are these dangerous that we're mm-hmm. um, overreacting. It's this is too much that these things aren't that bad. Well, I am reading a book called Dopamine Nation. Have, have you heard of that? I have. It's amazing. Yeah. Anna Lundke, yeah. She's amazing. Yeah. So she tells a story about, you know, in these labs, they study a lot of rats and they had this free rat running around and um, it, there was another caged rat inside like a plastic bottle. So the rat yeah. could see it. He instinctively went to try and help free his mm-hmm. friend, but then they also allowed him to self-administer heroin in, in his surroundings, which he did. And once he consumed the heroin, he was no longer interested in helping his brother free himself. It was that, I mean, I got chills on my arms when I read that. That's how powerful you lose the connection with people. You don't care. It's not possible to do both things at the same time. So that's why it's so dangerous. Luckily for me, my religion encourages abstinence from tobacco, caffeine, alcohol, and of course, drugs. And I can tell stories about friends that have, they drink pots of coffee or tea all day long. I knew, I knew a guy who drank tea from the minute he got up till the minute he went to bed. And the only time he stopped was when he had to go to the bathroom. So I just want to say, buddy, here's a drink of water, try it, slow it down. But it's the (laughs) same story that people that live off of coffee or excess alcohol, we've known those people. And we know that addiction is progressive. So it's just going to continually take more and more for the same effect. Um, I have had a few close relationships of people that have struggled with drugs. It runs in families. It destroys relationships. I've seen lives just completely fall apart through drugs. My son, interestingly, He had a a roofing and remodeling business and he had this employee that I just loved. I usually would end up getting to know his employees and he was the sweetest guy, sober, hard worker, soft-spoken, lovely to be around. But unfortunately he had a substance abuse problem Mm -hmm. and he just, he would come to work faithfully for this stretch and then, you know, he would go on a bender and he wouldn't be to work on Monday for sure. And maybe half a day on Tuesday and he would just get back into that vicious cycle. He just could not break out of it. But I love this man. He, um, when he would get in his habits, he would tend to be abusive with his girlfriend. Mm-hmm. And so she called the police one evening and they came and as they came into the house he was walking out of the bedroom. They, they might have beckoned him to come out. And he was as he was walking out of the bedroom, he had a knife in his hand and they shot him immediately and, and killed him. And that devastated me because he this was such a valuable life. He mm-hmm. just could not break free of the drug addiction. It, it, it mm-hmm. was a noose around his neck, but it just Absolutely. crushed me. And I have family members who have had deaths as results of drugs and I have family members who are active in recovery and continue to fight the fight every day. The ones that have lived yes. to be my age, they are all in some type of active recovery uh, program, but they all have tragic stories to tell. The ones that live have the tragic stories to tell. So that's why they're dangerous. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And it's, and you know, I will say um, when you're in it, you don't know it. You know, this, I, I agree talked about this person who, who, um, had these cycles, right. These, these cycles yes. be in life and out of life and in life, mm-hmm. and out of life. you yep. know, I, I did not have an addiction to alcohol. I did not have an addiction to substances, um, other than food, other than processed foods. Right. So the substances on our list, I did have addiction to the last half of them. Um, but they weren't illegal drugs or prescription drugs or alcohol, but my addiction showed up just like this man you're talking about. I would go in life and out of life, in life, out of life. Mm -hmm. And when I was out of life, it was a true, as they say in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous, I was a Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde. Mm -hmm. I I would show up as one person one day, um, 
or for a stretch of days. And then I would have this dark place that I would go to. I did not connect it to the fact that I just had a binge, mm. but I would have this place that I went to that I couldn't really understand why I was there. And I wasn't myself and I wouldn't return phone calls and I wouldn't engage with life. And I wouldn't engage with people I loved and people I, 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 you know, were in my life had to sort of come find me or, or try to pull me out of wherever I was. And it wasn't like I was anywhere. It wasn't like I was in, you know, a, a, a crack house. You know what I'm saying? It wasn't like I was off, you know, on a bender, but I, I, I had been on a food bender and I was not myself anymore. Right. So, um, I totally, in, in a way I see how the, how it can happen. And I see the parallels with, with processed food, my sure. processed food addiction. And that's why I'm so passionate about educating people because right. it does show up just like any other substance addiction. It yeah. does make your life. My, I lost jobs. I lost a marriage. I lost major relationships. I damaged relationships mm -hmm. with, with people that I will, I will, you know, to my knowledge anyway, I, I don't think I'll ever have a chance to repair. Mm -hmm. And it, my heart hurts when I think of the loss that I've had of the people that I love because of the addiction. Yeah. And the cycle that I was in uh, of self-harm and, and other harm and other neglect that I, I deeply hurt people that I, that I truly care about and love even, even a couple of them, you know, children that I, I would, I would give my, you know, a limb to, to, to see again mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and to, and to connect with again and, and to apologize to, I don't see that I'll, I'll have that opportunity, but you know, God, God is good. Maybe I will someday. Mm -hmm. But the idea that I, I, that I have to live knowing that I, that I had these cycles and that mm -hmm. I hurt those people, um, it's, it's, it's heavy, it's heavy. And, you know, I, I've, I've spent most of my life in addiction in some way, shape or form. I was smoking as a kid in a, you know, as a teen <laughs> in college, I, you know, was, and of course I, I was thinking I could control my weight with it, which is hilarious because I was already, <laughs> you know, obese. And I hear I was adding cigarettes to it. It was <laughs> delusional. Uh, I was killing myself two different ways. Mm -hmm. And, you know, alcoholism does run on both sides of my family. And as I said to you, Paige, before I could have easily been an alcoholic easily. Mm -hmm. It's just the food was more acceptable mm -hmm. at when you're three, it's more acceptable to go face first into a cake than it is to, mm -hmm. you know, pour yourself mm -hmm. a Manhattan. So I, I, the food was there for me. It was encouraged. It was socially acceptable. Um, and I know I have an addictive personality as they say in recovery, I have all the isms, right? I, <laughs> I, I, unfortunately am my, my mindset to this day. I have to be very aware of it. I have a mindset of fear. I have a mindset of, of, you know, what ifs and oh my gosh, and I'm going to try to control this or that, or because I, I don't, I can't trust that, that God or the universe will take care of me. It's, it's this instinctive mindset that I have, that I have to very, very aware, be very aware of so that I can, I can overcome it and choose differently every day because my default setting is lack sometimes and fear sometimes mm -hmm. um, le much less now than years ago, but it's still there. And it is leftover of a childhood of trauma and abuse and neglect. And when I think about, you know, my addictive personality, I'm very careful, even caffeine, it's on our list of addictive substances for a reason. Mm -hmm. I cannot, you know, um, moderate caffeine. It's something very hard for me to moderate. And I will have it two to three times a year when we're having long drives, we drive from Texas to New Jersey and back. I will have a cup of black coffee on the road if I'm for my driving day to make sure that I'm awake. It's <laughs> To me, it's the, it's the good, better, best, right? Yeah. Like, you know, what's, what's the worst, you know, the chemical energy drinks, those are the worst, mm -hmm. better, a cup of black coffee, not ideal, yeah. but it gets the job done. So I have an addictive brain. I have the isms. I have to be careful with these substances. Yeah, I agree. I think we've done a really good job of explaining why we're, this is not an overreaction to something that some people may say, it's not that bad. So you know, we've talked a lot about drugs uh, during this time and relating them to food as well. And so the question always becomes, is the treatment the same? And interestingly, I had a person close to me go to rehab recently, and we had a conversation when they got home a month later 
it was fascinating how the inpatient rehab was doing exactly what we do in food recovery. Why? Because it's located in the same part of the brain. It all operates the exact same. So the approach is the same. Um, we have to be careful with the addiction transference from drugs to food. That is very common. I was talking with a cousin of mine recently who was in town at a drug, uh, not rehab, but like a convention for people that have gotten right. off drugs. I don't know the exact name of it, yeah. but um, a convention. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for uh, people in recovery. And he was commenting about how much weight he had gained and all the weight that most of the people in the drug recovery program because of addiction transference. So have to be very careful of that. But with food, unless you go back to drugs, there's really no place to go. They but, had taken uh, their addiction to fermented sugar and transferred it to that's straight right. up sugar. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. So awareness, what yes. about you? Super common, super. I've seen it all the time. Mm -hmm. And you know, guys, I want to be clear. Paige and I aren't sitting here on our, on our, in our lofty ivory tower, judging everyone. We lived this life. We lived the pain. We lived the addiction. We lived the cycle, the, the shame, the blame, the self judgment, the self, you know, in my case, in my case, self-hatred and self-harm, we lived it. We understand it. We are not here by any means to judge or point a finger because we, we know full well, we have three pointing back at us. So it is from our perspective and I, uh, an attempt to educate and an attempt to help you identify to, you know, what we've gone through in our addiction recovery. But, you know, when I was in first in recovery, I knew that I was, I, I learned that I was a food alcoholic, right. And I began mm. to identify strongly with the AA world because mm -hmm. I had a lot of not, not now I did not realize I had a lot of alcoholism on both sides of the family, but I did realize that alcoholics were a lot like me and I was a lot like them, even though, like I said, my, my drug of choice, so to speak, as if I had a choice, my drug of choice was not alcohol, but I saw these long time alcoholics in recovery. These, these men and women who would travel the circuit, they call it speaking yep two different alcoholics in recovery. They were, they were, even though they're very strongly about principles and not personalities, these people, these men and women still were, were, were lauded. They were, they were very highly regarded in the community of, of recovery there. And I remember, you know, you don't find them on camera rarely because these are usually closed meetings or speaker meetings. And of course it's the whole anonymous thing, right? You don't mm -hmm. want to see them on, on camera. It makes sense. I, I happened to see one of the men who I followed for a long time and just thought he was so wise. And I, I happened to see a, a, him on camera once, you know, a video of him speaking. And I was shocked. He, he could not move. He was immobile because of obesity. Mm -hmm. um, and I remember just my heart broke for him because I realized that here was this wise man changing so many lives. And here he was, he had, he was modeling his other addiction mm -hmm. modeling it. And, right. and he was saying like, look at me. I, I, I'm recovered, recovering, right. Never recovered, but you know, I'm healthy, but he obviously was still abusing food and it was so, so sad. Yeah. Um, and I see it now in, I I'm in a lot of the 12 step meeting rooms, um, for different, different times of my week. And, I will be in a room that follows an AA meeting and they'll be, you know, they have the birthdays, right? And I, that's a wonderful yeah. celebration of life and they bring in processed food. Yeah. And I, I, the first thing I do when I walk into that room to host a meeting is I will clear out the food. And if there's already members in that room, I will get a lot of pushback when I clear that room of food. And I just look at them and say, guys, I, I wouldn't walk in with a bottle of vodka to your meeting and yeah. expect to sit there while I drank it. Mm-hmm. And they were just like, well, you got a point. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, you know, usually they get it, but it's real. It's real. It's so. gut wrenching. It's gut wrenching to see it. And you just want to scoop everybody up and say, come with me. I've got a way I can get you out of this. And Which, they, you know what they, they can too. They can too. They're just not seeing it yet. I agree. I agree. It's just, they don't know how they don't know the way they don't understand it. And quite frankly, I'm sure some people think, well, this is just how it is. I, I, I don't <laughs> know anything else to do other than except this is just my lot, but exactly. we're here to tell you it, that is not your lot, not your which, lot. you know, you always wonder about how do people get into this? How, 
how did this happen? I remember hearing a story about this girl and she started her story by saying, I was on the bathroom floor in a train station alone and I never knew this would be my rock bottom. I never knew when I took that first hit of, I don't even remember what it was, that uh, this is not what I envisioned my life turning into homeless on the bathroom floor of some public train station, just totally alone, just literally lifeless and wishing she would die. And that's not the glamorous picture that when people start that, that they think this is where it's going to end up. I, I think people start with maybe peer pressure or curiosity but no one imagines I'm going to try this one time and it's going to totally rob me of my life. And then people start using it to fill a need and then it keeps going. Yep. You experience that thrill. It's just, uh, yeah, I wish there was a bigger warning label. Oh, absolutely. And the stories that we see in the media, right? Real, real stories yeah. in the media. Yeah. Stories that we hear, like you talked about in your, in your, in your social circle and my social and family circles, it still doesn't, you know, I've, I've lost family members that I, that I love and care about to, to addiction um, and, uh, or to the, the lifestyle of addiction. Right. And it's, it's, it's so sad. And I look at it as what leading, you know, when I think about what led people, what led me to this, you know, I've talked about this before Paige, you know, there I was, I, you know, was wearing this, you know smaller size. And I, I'd done this whole big transformation physically. And I thought I was, you know, such a, such a <laughs> model of, 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 you know, success, weight loss, mm-hmm. success, mm-hmm. And standing behind you know, backstage at the Steve Harvey show, waiting to go on. Mm-hmm. And, uh, I think that they, I think they even had me busting through a picture of me from before. Oh gosh. <laughs> One of those. I need to get that clip. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. It's out there. It's out there. But, uh, it is actually was a great, he, he, it was a great interview. He's a wonderful man. So it's, it's no knock on Mr. Harvey, but it was more like I'm standing backstage thinking I've arrived. And mm-hmm. I remember thinking, why am I so empty? This yeah. isn't, I thought this would be it. And I'm still so empty. It's because I still had a God-sized hole in my soul. Yeah. I, I thought that looking a certain way after years of, of not looking that way, or being received for being pretty or acceptable in society. I thought that would be the answer. Mm-hmm. And it, it it wasn't, I was still so empty and, mm-hmm. you know, it was a result of, of years of, of trauma, years of childhood, you know, abuse. And, and I don't just, you know, I'm not talking about physical abuse only I'm talking about emotional and social um, and psychological abuse. That mm-hmm. is like a thousand little cuts over the years. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's not big stuff. Uh, you know, I, I did not, you know, I was not, um, put into a foster home or my, you know, my parents weren't, weren't taken away from me for that reason, but they were, but they were, they were distant for, for a myriad of other reasons. And my, you know, had a parent in prison and, you know, things that, that modeled for me chaos right. and modeled for me, lack of trust in, in God and the family of origin modeled unforgiveness and modeled, um, you know, uh, fear. And yeah. so that's, those are the lessons that I learned. And when you're constantly grasping at straws and you don't have a, a higher power, as it were, you don't have a belief in something greater than yourself, not because you think you're that great, but because you just, it's not, it's not taught to you in a, in a meaningful way. Mm-hmm. It was, it was taught in a, in a very, um, surface way, but it's not, it wasn't meaningful and it wasn't, it wasn't something I internalized. So sure enough, I grew up and I'm grasping at straws. Right. You know, as you were telling your story, I was thinking, well, these are habits that started from your earliest memories. Absolutely. So what what else would you expect? Exactly. What, what, where else could you have possibly gone, it, but continued? It could have been no other way. And that's what my recovery has taught me. There was no other way for me to turn out the way than the way I did. Yeah. And it's not, yeah. it's not to point a finger at anyone. It is my family of origin and the generations before me, yeah, uh, there was no way I could have been any different. The, the cards were stacked. Exactly. The cards were stacked. And so, you know, w- what do people do when they're in situations where they can't say no, that they're weak to it and they're in a situation and they're being offered it? I heard someone 
telling a story earlier today in a meeting about how they were with friends who were drinking this weekend and she did end up drinking and she was telling me about it today and she said I I'm gonna have to get new friends I I can't go back and do that but, and I just I feel better coming and just saying out loud I, I did drink it, it's not like a confessional she just wanted to tell somebody about that. And, um, she said, I've even thought that I'm going to have to go back and tell these friends. I can't, I just can't do that anymore. So, you know, that leads into the point of just trying not to put yourself in a position to say no, first of all, that's, that's, I'm a scaredy cat. I don't want to be set up for that. So controlling your environment, seeking out help, if it's bigger than you are, and it is bigger than most of us, there's plenty of support groups out there and lots of people that want to help. It's a very common concern. And hopefully knowing that this is a common concern helps. And it's just like you and I were just now saying, it's not your fault with food. It's not your fault. You had no idea when you were developing this addiction as a child. So it is not your fault. No, not at we're, all. we're not victims. And Part of Jamie and I um, mission is to help educate and free people from this dark place. It's not our fault, but it is our responsibility to recover. Right. It's not our fault, but it is our responsibility to, to teach ourselves differently Mm -hmm. and to do differently and to, to model differently for others, uh, especially if we're parents or influence young, younger children or younger generations it is absolutely our responsibility. So, you know, we're not victims. Right. But I also want to be very clear that I believe that we do have a responsibility to recover and to be mm-hmm. contributing members of society and to, right. to leave, 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 leave life better than we found it. Mm-hmm. Better than it was given to us. Mm-hmm. I heard someone talking earlier. I think I've mentioned this before about he wants to write his obituary and then just work backwards from there. Oh, I love it. In life. Yeah. I love it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. What do you Begin want on your tomb? mind? Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> well, Anything- yeah, just, I'm sorry. I just want to add one thing about the, you know, what do I do if I can't say no? Yeah. Um, I'm a big believer in changing your environment. And I don't mean now there's the, in the recovery world, there's this whole idea of, they call it pulling, pulling a geographic, right. Is to literally move to a different right. city. Mm-hmm. Wherever you go, there you are, by the way, that doesn't work. I've yep. tried it. I've tried it, by the way. It doesn't work. <laughs> Trust me, it doesn't work. Um, but it really, when I say change your environment, I mean walk out of the room, get outside and go for a walk, call, call change your thought environment, change your mental environment, call a friend, get out to a meeting, go wa- you know, watch a silly movie that doesn't have a lot of cues in it. Um, you know, remind yourself that you're here for a reason. Like if yeah, I got news for you guys. If if we're here on this planet, there's a reason we're here. Yeah, you know, God is is pretty good at organizing this this kind of thing, and we're still here. There's a reason we're still here, mm-hmm. and finding your purpose while you're here, I think, is one of the most rewarding and and I, I believe critical parts of of life. And you know, some would say carrying carrying the message of of you know the spiritual delivery deliverance message is, is also while we're here, why we're here. Connect, connection. We're exactly. here for connection. Exactly. And it's connecting, inspiring, lifting each other up. You know, that's why I, I have the three P's purpose, posse and prayer. Right. So for me, it's that's, those are my three P's. I have a strong purpose. I have a posse that I cultivate and they might be a posses in different areas of, of the country and online and in the real world. And then prayer is something that I really, I do for others, for connection, I do it, you know, for my own connection to self and my connection to, to God, as I, as I understand him. And, and that is, you know, they, they help those three things always help me say no. Beautiful. You know, there's a lot, we get some pushback when we talk about marijuana because it is legal in a lot of places now. So, you know, what's the big deal and is it marijuana? isn't it safe? And it's prescribed to cancer patients for Pete's sake. So buzz off, you know, get off my back. So first of all, is as someone who has a food addiction, and quite frankly, 80% of the people do, if not more. So Mm -hmm. it's an appetite stimulate stimulant. Secondly, it's not considered as safe as it used to be. Studies have shown that the THC level in marijuana has risen 
uh, to 24% from 1975 to 2017. There was a study on more than 14,000 people 50 and older and found that the higher doses of THC were associated with a higher incidence of thinking and perception mm -hmm. issues, not the good kind, as mm -hmm. well as dizziness. So it, it, it ain't that great. No, nope, absolutely not. And when I think about, you know, the, the, the studies on marijuana, the studies on marijuana, we know that it grades brain cells. We know it leads to overeating. We know it leads to loss of judgment and loss of inhibition. Um, and, and I was just looking up this word just to be sure that I pronounced it right, because it is something that uh, it scares the daylights out of me. It's the whole, <laughs> like, the, fent the fentanyl. Oh my crisis. gosh. Oh, we, it's huge. Guys, I don't know about you. Maybe I watch too much, you know, law and order, but I don't, <laughs> I don't know what, what, these recreational and street drugs are laced with anymore. And I don't care oh, yeah. what kind of dispensary you're, you're buying your, you know, your illegal or, or legal substances from, you don't know, you don't know. It's not like there's a, there's a government regulation um, across the board that you can read about that, you know, is, is safe. And frankly, governments, the government regulates our food supply. And we know that yeah. that's, designed to make us fat, sick, and nearly dead. So mm -hmm. why would we think that any government regulation of, of, of legalized drugs or recreational drugs would be any, any better to advocate for our health? Mm -hmm. This, this idea that, that we are, you know, um, in a world that, that the government will protect us with, with, when it comes to food substances or drug substances, um, I, I understand that, that it's, it's comforting to think that, but we have to be our own best advocates. And to me, if I'm buying a recreational drug from a dispensary or, or from any, anyone <laughs> using a recreational yeah. drug of any kind, I'm not my own best advocate. I'm just not. Yeah, no, a great, great point to end on uh, with, with that topic. And some believe that this addiction is a disease and other believe that it's a choice. I definitely think it's a disease. I think you may be predisposed to not know it. So when you experiment, then all of a sudden you're hooked. Choices are involved, of course, in the solution. And by that, I mean, um, you can, you, my husband can eat one cookie and be fine and not one another. So he's not predisposed like, like yeah. I am. It doesn't have the same effects as um, uh, on me, but I have to make choices to fight my way out of this. He has an entire cupboard I don't go in that is filled with all kinds of cookies and stash and stuff. And he, those will stay in there past the expiration date oh, yeah. oh, because yeah. it does, he is unaffected. So he uh -huh. does not fight the same disease, but he likes his caffeine and I could care less about caffeine. So it's just our drug of choice, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. And my husband is the same way as yours, by the way. And, and it's so funny because, you know, when I did come into the house and, and had them move the stuff to a different cabinet, the stuff kept expiring and going bad and getting mold, you know, the stuff that could get moldy, got moldy PS, most of the stuff that's in there can't get moldy because it's so highly processed. Right. Right. But, um, it got, you know, super, super stale and inedible. And, and it got to the point where, you know, uh, he, he didn't really care about it, but I do agree. Page addiction in my book is a disease. Yeah. PS I have the disease. I'm yeah. Not, I'm not pointing a finger being like, Oh, those disease <laughs> addicts. Nope. I'm one of you. I'm yeah. right there. I've got it. And in the reason that I say it's a disease, it's because it is not a, um, a normal state in the body. It is not, it is when something outside of you or inside of you in, in a, in a, in a dysfunctional way is controlling you. Mm -hmm. It is not a normal state of the body. Mm -hmm. is not, is not finding balance. It's out mm -hmm. of balance. that good point. So mm -hmm. when we think of, you know, of, of something that is the symptom of disease, not only are we out of balance, but it is progressive. It gets worse yes. over time, yes. just like diabetics yes. go from, you know, gee, I, oh, gee, I got to take, you know, um, uh, uh, my, my diabetes medication. And I have to, you know, maybe inject insulin a couple of times a week, fast forward a few years Yeah, being assessed for, for, um, issues related to blindness and yeah, amputation amputations and mm -hmm. wounds that won't heal and all kind of, they are progressive diseases. Mm -hmm. Right. 
you know, so which is a good segue into how do we get out of this? Can you recover on your own or do you need a recovery yeah. What do you group? think? So you and I, I like this topic because you and I are a little bit different. I have a smaller bucket than you do as far as connection needs. And it is possible to do it on your own. So first of all, that I totally believe you can do it on your own. Plenty of people have just, they say they quit and that's it. Um, but it sure seems like it's a lot easier and more enjoyable to link together. I maybe need less connection with others than you do. You are very social, mm -hmm. very, a great personality. People like to be with you and around you and you enjoy people. So what do you have to say about recovering uh, from your own? Yes. Uh, thank you. I, I agree. I don't, it's so funny because I don't think of you as not a social person at all. I think of you as someone that people love to be around and, <laughs> and I, I love to be around, <laughs> but I never think of you as not having those same needs. Um, there are some people that I, that I think, you know, they have a, maybe a small tribe and they really like that, you know, they have a very small amount of people. And as long as they're connecting with those people every day, they're fine. I'm the kind of person that I, I do have that those, those very close people, maybe two or three, they're very close to me. Mm -hmm. but my circle is larger in the sense, not because I, uh, I need it, but because it's just kind of, I don't know, I guess just how I'm wired. I appreciate having uh, people in my life, uh, a community around me. For me, my addiction got incrementally worse every time I was alone. Um, isolation is an uh, indication that I'm in my addiction again. If I'm tempted to isolate or stay home, uh, it's usually because there's something food or something at home, mm -hmm. right? If I'm tempted to stay home and I have no physical symptoms or no, you know, maybe like need for sleep, need for rest, need for just rejuvenation, then there's probably food at the other end of that equation. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. and I used to think I could do it on my own. Uh, but in the long, for me in the long term, I realized that my own sick thinking and behavior got me to the bottom that I, that I bounced along for years. Uh, and if I'm relying on that same brain to get me out of that, it's not going to happen, right? I'm, I'm going to get back to where I got before. So I need more than any other person of the world. I need God first, right? Mm -hmm. And then I, I like to surround myself or be part of communities with inspirational folks. I'm very selective about the people that I spend time with. I have a lot of friends in recovery and that's very, very intentional. Mm -hmm. Um, because they model for me something that I want. They model for yeah. me. They have something I want. Right. Smart, smart. You know, we've talked a lot about the emotional strains of substance abuse, but there's also some, a physical toll that it takes on our bodies yeah. too. I've never been on caffeine, but I know people go through major withdrawals mm -hmm. with that. The same as with sugar during mm -hmm. COVID, they had to keep the alcohol stores open because of DTs from withdrawals yeah. from people with alcoholic. It was yeah. too dangerous to cut people off immediately. So yeah. we're talking about liver disease, lung cancer, heart disease, vitamin deficiencies, even brain damage and birth defects. So there's a absolutely. lot that plays into that. Yes, absolutely. You know, substances we're talking about today, especially in combination, right? If you good, have good you know, point. Ca caffeine mm -hmm. and sugar or or, you know, mm -hmm. nicotine and, and alcohol, mm -hmm. they can turn on genetic markers for, di yes. for diseases. So they say genetics load the gun and lifestyle pulls the trigger. I believe that wholly, wholly, yeah. I believe that, mm -hmm. um, it, it, you know, we see the genetic markers being turned on for dementia, cancers, many different cancers, diabetes, kidney and liver disease. These substances are just not worth messing with because what, what they can do is you never, it's Russian roulette. You never know when that genetic yeah going to flip over yeah you're going to go from i can have it once in a while to i can't live without it right exactly exactly you know so let's finish up talking about this before we get to some listener questions we've got yeah. four great listener questions yeah. if you have an addiction anyone that's listening please listen to this section if you have an addiction what what's the first step how do i get out of this and our message to you is make sure you're ready find a support group, learn how to cope with stress and reduce the cues and triggers around you. We know this is an addiction of cues and triggers. Yes. Get educated, listen to our podcast. When it comes to caffeine, slowly reducing helps. 
If it's alcohol, you need to seek professional help to make sure you're safe. But we mm -hmm. have a lot of answers for you with when it comes to food. What do you want to add on to that, Jamie, for people who are trying to find a way out? When Paige and I started this podcast, guys, we were very, very intentional about the words we chose to represent our message. And we chose real food recovery because we had more than just a, a message about weight loss. We had more than just a message about, you know, uh, stay away from sugar. We had more than just a message about, you know, um, get off the processed food. Our message was really about recovery. And that's why we're here talking about all these ad addictive substances. The media, the, the media industry, the food industry and alcohol industries, they all sell fear and confusion. Yes. Just like big tobacco sold us back in the sixties and seventies, when we were onto them with the cancer, they started to sell confusion. They started to put out and guys, this is happening. This has been happening for decades, by the way, in the food industry. Do you, I, how many of us are thinking of those people mag or I guess it was time magazine or, or the, some of the major medical journals that have, you know, these big announcements about butter is back and eggs are safe. And <laughs> so, for instance, for instance, I'm not, I'm not going against eggs. I'm just saying guys, they have these big proclamations because people right. are like, wait a second. I thought butter clogs our arteries and we die. Sugar's a killer. Sugar's safe. Like yeah. there's these, these articles are everywhere. The media is very intentional about confusing us. They sell confusion. Mm -hmm. They're not selling mm -hmm. you products. They're not, they're selling you confusion and it's very intentional. They want us to question data. They want us to question science and be so confused about what direction is right. My, my direction is to stay away from mainstream anything if I can, uh, in meeting, you know, whatever is mainstream about media and confusion, whatever is mainstream about the major food industries, of course, the alcohol industry, you know, those things take me away. The confusion takes me away yeah. from my spiritual connection from peace. Yep. The substances take me away from my spiritual connection mm -hmm. and to take me away from my energy, my focus, my mental clarity, my peace, mm -hmm. serenity, my connection. It's just nothing I want to mess with. I, I agree. Good, good point to end on. Great message. So as we kind of segue between our listener questions, we do want to bring up one more point that we know drugs have a big impact on the noggin. We've, we've talked about the impacts on the brain. So what are some other things that you can do to protect your brain? There's no miracle brain pill for brain health, though one of the most important things you can do is keep your weight stable. That may be a shocker to some, but that was important because we're here talking about food addiction recovery. We wanted to bring that up. A 2021 meta analysis of data found that being significantly overweight increased the risk of dementia. Surprisingly, however, being underweight was also a risk factor. Turns out you can be too thin if not too rich. Plus, getting extra exercise is important to cut your risk. And just so you know, our next episode, 18, will be on the role of nutrition in the aging brain. And we really want to drive home the point that what we do today is what shows up in our older years. It's too late. Once, once you're in the older years, you can't start then. Right. So uh, what we're talking about, it's, it's never too early to start taking good care of your brain health. Yes. So with that, we've got a few minutes. I want to do quickly these four questions. The first one is, do I have to be off all addictive substances in order to recover from food addiction? Or can I still have caffeine and drink? Well, we know it's tough. Alcohol takes your resistance down and it slows your metabolism. Caffeine can be problematic because of the fat and the sugar added to it. Basically, they're both triggers for eating poorly. Coffee can cause the body to crave sugary drinks or sweets. Do you want to add anything to that, Jamie? Uh, no, I think that that really covers it. Um, for me, caffeine was really toxic in large amounts. Um, and it got to the point where I would need more and more to feel the same effects. Um, mm -hmm. and that, so for me, it, it, it was either a V at first, it was a vehicle for, for fat and sugar. Right. And then when I pulled the fat <laughs> and sugar out, it was just something that I, I needed for my workouts. Right. I thought mm -hmm. that's what I said, I needed mm -hmm. for my workouts. And then I needed more and more over time to get the same effect by the time that I COVID hit and I no longer took the caffeine in the morning before my, my workout, I detoxed off of it for the first time in a, many years. I was so, there was, 
a solid week of major detox symptoms, major wow. pain, major neurological wow. things, major mood and, and depression and anxiety and all kinds of swings and all kinds of physical issues, pain and, and inflammation and liver. And I could feel my, my, the side of my, the body where my liver is, all of that was totally just aching. Oh and my it gosh. Was, it was, yeah. That's how much. I had done with the caffeine and, and didn't even think that I had done anything with it. So there's our statement, folks. <laughs> That's our answer. Don't do yeah. that. Don't do it. So uh, I'm worried about my kids picking up this food addiction too. How can I keep them from being affected by my issues? How do I protect them from pop processed food addiction? Example, yes. keep, keep a clean home, fix clean meals, talk about it, educate lead yeah. by example. It's their journey, but do not pressure your kids. Just no. keep talking in a non-judgmental way and, and walking the walk, living the lifestyle. That's right. That's right. Yep. I agree. And you know what? It's their journey. They're going to be exposed to it everywhere. They're going to have to find their own path guys. It's just the same. It's the same thing about an alcoholic An alcoholic never quits because their family member wants them to quit. They quit when they find the reason. So it's really important to just let, let your children model for them. That's the best thing you can do. Don't, res don't restrict it or don't make it vilified in the home, but educate them on, this is what love looks like. I love yeah. you so that I'm not, so I'm not giving you this mm -hmm. processed foods. I love mm -hmm. you. So I'm not gonna, even though you're 18 years old, I'm not gonna, uh, you know, and, and you're at home for the night and I'm going to buy you booze because that's what a cool parent does. I know. That's, that's not what a cool parent does. That's what, the, right. that's what an enabling parent does. Yep. Yep. So we, we want to be really careful about being honest with ourselves about what, what love really looks like for our kids yeah. mm -hmm. and what modeling we can do along those lines. Yeah. Beautifully said. I love my nightly glass of wine. A little bit of vino is good for my heart, right? Well, maybe not. Several organizations such as the Mayo Clinic still endorse the idea, but the American Heart Association doesn't recommend drinking from any form of alcohol to gain health benefits. Research is beginning to coalesce around the idea that light or moderate drinking may not help to prevent heart disease so much, so much so that the World Health, Feder the World Heart Federation declared in 2022 that no level of alcohol yeah. is safe for your heart health. Yeah. agree completely it's a gateway to progressive disease progressive addiction i strongly do not believe yes. in any amount of any addictive substances being okay agreed there are some major major influences in the wellness and well-being world i mean i'm talking highly credentialed authors and speakers and and you know personalities that that will advocate for a glass of wine at night and, um, I just think, why, why are you saying this? There are so many other ways to get the polyphenols. There's so many other ways to get, you know, why does it have to be wine? Why can't you advocate for a handful of red grapes? Why can't you advocate? Yeah. You know I'm saying? Like, why does it, you know, it, so it just tells me that, that there's, there's relaxation. There's, there's a, there's a ritual that happens for that person. There's a relaxation mm -hmm. ritual. There's a perspective mm -hmm. that they have to have this thing to relax or it, it it's a punctuation mark for their day. I get it. But those, those to me are all signs of something that you're using outside of you to alter your state. Beautiful. That's, that's addiction. You said that very, very well. Uh, last one that I wanted to make sure to get in there. I have the occasional cigarette. Does that really matter? Yes, it does. A review of 141 studies showed that people who smoke just one cigarette a day still have half the heart disease risk of people who smoke 20. Absolutely. That was a shocking statistic. Absolutely. Yeah, it is shocking. It is shocking. Paige, before we close, I just want to just one little caveat. You said earlier that we have a we have an upcoming episode uh, for the role of nutrition on the aging brain. It's not episode 18 yet guys. So it's not our next episode, but in the future, we will, in the near future, we will have an episode on the role of nutrition on the aging brain. So stay tuned for it. Look for it. It'll be labeled as such, but I just didn't want to miss you know, falsely advertise to anyone, um, inadvertently. So oops, my coming. bad. That's okay. Bad. It's coming. It's coming. <laughs> we actually, our episode 18 is all about stress management. 
which is the other side to the addiction coin. If your stress pathways are activated, your addiction, your addiction is, is ready to strike. So we have to talk about stress pathways next. Good job, Jamie. Keep, keep me in line. I need, I need a, I need a keeper. <laughs> Back at you, sister. Thanks again for a Thanks. great conversation. Thanks guys. See you later. Bye-bye. See you soon. Take care.